What's going on guys, Ron Perita here from Techno Buffalo and we've done a couple videos in the past sharing our camera setup for these Techno Buffalo videos. However, I do a little bit of documentary filmmaking out on the side and I have a different setup for that. So today, I wanted to walk you guys through what that setup is and what you guys can do as maybe beginning filmmakers or beginning documentary filmmakers. So first off, we have our bag here and the most important thing is always obviously gonna be your camera. I like to use a Panasonic GH4. It's very small, it's very compact. You get built-in 4K on SD cards it's all good stuff. The SD cards I use are, it's not in there, um, are usually SanDisk cards. Uh, you can figure out how fast of cards you need. The lens I have on here right now is a Voiklander 42.5 millimeter. So because the GH4 has a two time crop on the sensor, this is actually equivalent to about an 85 millimeter or precisely an 85 millimeter. This is one lens that I do carry with me for portrait work, for close ups. And these lenses actually have such a close focusing distance, they almost function as macro lenses. And so all manual, manual aperture, manual focus, great lens, uh, standard Manfrotto tripod plate on the bottom. Moving onward, we, oh, and one other note, the reason I also like this camera for documentary filmmaking is the batteries are insane. They last forever. Uh, this is a Sennheiser mic for your iPhone, so it uses a lightning port. This is more of a backup solution for me. Obviously, I would prefer not to get audio with this, maybe more higher quality mics, which we'll get into in a second. But if you have nothing else to record audio and you need something uh, very quickly and you have your iPhone on you, you can plug this in and put this in the pocket of your subject who you're interviewing, or if you need to do some voiceover yourself, you can use it for that. So that's fantastic as well. Moving on, we have two filters. Uh, I use two filters from Tiffin. This is a circular polarizer. This is a Fader ND. Uh, I use the Fader ND way more than the polarizer, but the polarizer helps when shooting through windows. Uh, if you want to bring the vibrancy of the the sky down in a sort of wide shot or something. Uh, you can play around with that and see what you like. But the Fader ND is an absolute necessity when shooting with DSLRs. Next, we have hard drives because when we're filming, we have to be able to back up what we're doing. So once our SD cards get full, you usually go on a laptop and back up footage. Uh, we have two drives here. I have the Samsung T3, which you guys have seen in videos of mine before. I usually work off of this drive. This is about a 512, I believe. So, and this is the drive where I really back up a lot more stuff. This is a Lacie four terabyte hard drive. You want something uh, large, obviously it depends on what kind of file type you're working with as well. Moving on very important is headphones. It doesn't really matter what headphones you have. As long as you have something to monitor audio uh, coming out of the camera, that is crucial uh, during interviews or even during regular filming, just to see whether your audio is popping, whether you're getting clean dialogue, all that good stuff. Continuing with audio, when you're doing interview work, you wanna lav up, or that's how I prefer to do it at least, so that you're getting a clean audio track without getting too much ambient sound. Uh, I'm a big fan of this lav kit. We've talked about the Sennheiser lav kits before, but this is the Rode Filmmaker kit, you basically have sort of two components to it. You have uh, a receiver, this goes on top of the camera with the hot shoe, plugs in via 3.5 millimeter, and this goes on the subject. They work really well, very simple, very straightforward, and give a good consistent signal. Next, we have our other lens. Uh, this is the Voiklander 17.5 millimeter f0.95. So this is sort of a sister lens, part of this set. There are other lenses. These are my two favorites because this is a 35 millimeter equivalent. This is an 80, uh, or rather an 85 millimeter equivalent. So these two cover me off pretty good. Um, a backup camera that I like to have is a GoPro. This is the GoPro Hero 5. Just came out. I don't use this camera primarily for too much stuff, but it's mainly if we need to shoot, uh, shoot some backup stuff, some underwater stuff. And it's really like a rescue camera where I can't necessarily put a camera of this size, uh, you know, in small areas and whatnot, even like head mounting it or chest mounting it. So depending on what you're doing, if you have it planned, you want to mount or rather bring the straps and mounts with you. So next we have the Panasonic GH4 battery charger. Uh, I do carry extra batteries with me. However, I like to have this in case I do need to charge any of the batteries if we do run out of juice, which is very, very rare, as I mentioned. Uh, those extra batteries, this is one. I'll usually carry one with me. And uh, if I'm having an extra long shoot, I will have a couple extras. Then in addition to that, we next have uh, some AA batteries. This is for, uh, I carry a Zoom H6, which we'll get into in a second. And uh, if your mic packs, these mic packs, for example, run on AA batteries. So those are for that. Continuing and finishing up our mic situation, we have the Sennheiser 
440, I believe it is. It's a very odd looking mic. Um, I used it for the first time recently this last week. It's an MKE 440. And this is probably one of the most directional mics I've ever used. It picks up very, very little ambient sound. We'll be doing tests with this in the future. And if you guys would like, we can actually do a review of it. Big, big fan of this. Continuing onward, stabilization is super, super important. Uh, we have this Manfrotto tripod. As you can see, it is very, very tiny. Uh, it uses the same Manfrotto plates we have on here, which most Manfrotto tripods do. That's why I like it. Super light, super small, super portable. Fits in one backpack. You can obviously, with a lot of this gear, go more complex, bigger, or smaller. You don't need all of it, depending on what your needs are, but these are mine. Uh, continuing onwards, we have the front pocket here in this backpack. And this has been through absolute war, so please bear with me on this case. But this is the Zoom H6N in here with uh, various attachments of XY mic, forget what this mic is called, and a shotgun attachment. So you can also attach uh, different XLRs if you want to run multiple audio setups. In interviews, usually, I like to run an on-camera mic, then a lav mic, so I can sort of mix the two and get the best of both worlds if I want some ambient sound and a clear voice track. And last but definitely not least, one of the most important things always is a laptop. Um, you just always have that just to back up to these hard drives and footage. And that's really my setup for documentary filmmaking. It's, it's pretty basic. I like to keep it light because usually if I'm shooting by myself or with one other person, we don't want to be lugging a ton of gear around. We don't want gear to run into or rather stop us from capturing the story we're trying to capture. So documentary filmmaking is all well and good when you can get everything you need in camera. But of course, that's not always possible. In a lot of commercial filmmaking situations, corporate filmmaking, or videos that you even just want to post on YouTube sometimes, you will run into licensing issues. This is where Adobe Stock comes into play. It's a stock library, but what makes it better than other stock libraries is not only their huge selection, but how integrated Adobe Stock is into the other Adobe apps. So here at Techno Buffalo, we edit on Adobe Premiere Pro. It's one of my favorite pieces of software. We also use Adobe After Effects. We use the whole suite. Adobe Stock is built into Premiere very, very intuitively and makes it very easy to use. So by hitting libraries at the top, I have this panel pop up on the right. Immediately, I have a search bar that says search Adobe Stock. I can look for any sort of image that I want or anything that I want. If I search camera, I'll have a bunch of images of cameras pop up, all sorts of stuff. Once you find what you're looking for, I can drag it into the timeline. And as you can see, it's a usable clip, just like anything I would have shot and imported myself. In fact, it even comes up in my project folder off to the left. The only issue being that it has a watermark on it saying Adobe Stock. All I have to do, however, to get rid of that is actually license the clip. So once you've edited in whatever you want, you can actually play around with the clip, see how it fits, make sure it's exactly what you are looking for, and then to confirm it, you just hit license clip. And by licensing it, it doesn't move anywhere in the timeline. Adobe simply replaces it with a non-watermarked file. You don't have to mess around with anything in your timeline, anything in your video. It's gonna be just the way you wanted it. And if you wanted to pick it up today, you can download it from Softcat, a UK distributor, as well as Adobe. Go ahead and check out the links down below in the description if this is interesting to you. I personally think it's a great resource that every creative should have on deck, whether you're a graphic designer, a photographer, it comes in handy just when you need it. But let me know what you guys think. What would you guys add to this setup? What do you guys use? Let me know if this helped and leave us a comment down below. Give us a thumbs up if you like this video. Thank you so much for watching.